All right, you can open your, uh, your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, or turn your Bible app on your phone to 1 Corinthians 12. Um, we did a really uh, fast flyby on, on pneumatology, just to kind of set the table a little bit there. And now we're going to begin to transition to looking at the spiritual gifts. Um, what we're going to do tonight is really look at the gifts in terms of their characteristics. And then tomorrow we'll spend the first session defining, trying to define a lot of the gifts that you see here in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, except for the gift of prophecy, which will be the next se- session after that. And, uh, and then we're going to talk uh, tomorrow about how do you pursue the gifts of the Spirit. So um, we're not getting into defining the gifts specifically tonight, because I wanted you to see some of the characteristics of the gifts, and that's what we're going to do in this time. So um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1-11, through 11, title of this outline, Spirit-Filled People using their spiritual gifts. Verse 1 in 1 Corinthians 12, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He wills. Let's pray. Lord, we we just want to pause for a moment and declare our need for the Spirit. Would You fill us tonight with Your Holy Spirit? Would You, Holy Spirit, work in a way that brings these verses to life? not in our understanding and knowledge of them, but to life in our hearts, so that we can experience Your presence and even be stirred by the Spirit regarding the gifts of the Spirit. Because we know they're given to each of us that are sitting here who are Christians, and they're given for this purpose, the common good of this church and the common good of the churches represented here. We ask that you would do all that in a way that reflects your glory and brings Jesus much praise. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We all live in a material, traffic jam, schedule-packed world. We daily feel the pressures of work. You may be tired tonight after your work week and We feel the pressures of raising our family and of providing for ourselves. On top of that, our cars break down. The roofs on your houses need replaced. We need to go to the doctor more frequently as we grow older because our bodies are aging. All of those things serve as daily reminders to us that you and I, we live in this physical world. And we must be careful that the demands of living in a material, physical world, don't lull us into forgetting that as Christians we are actually spiritual people. See, if we as Christians forget that we are spiritual people who are indwelt with the Spirit of God, we will live unaware of the Spirit's presence and power in our lives. Richard Lovelace says this, I put this in your outline, the failure 
To recognize the Holy Spirit as personally present in our lives is widespread in the churches today. Even where Christians know about the Holy Spirit doctrinally, they have not necessarily made a deliberate point of getting to know Him personally. A normal relationship with the Holy Spirit should at least approximate the Old Testament experience described in Psalm 139. A profound awareness that we are always face to face with God. That as we move through the life, through life, the presence of His Spirit is the most real and powerful factor in our daily environment. That underneath the momentary static of events, conflicts, problems, and even excursions into sin, He, meaning the Holy Spirit, is always, always there. So Christian, let me ask you tonight, do you believe that? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit is always there? See, we can't allow the demands of living in a physical world to numb us to the reality that as Christians, we are spiritual people. Now, in opening this section of the letter to the Corinthians, where he's addressing the spiritual gifts, as chapters 12 through 14, he begins the conversation by drawing their attention to this truth that they are spiritual people. That's how he begins it. He does it in verses 2 and 3, by reminding them of who they were before they were converted to Christianity. They were once pagans, he calls them, because that's who they were, who were being led astray by mute idols. But now they are people who declare that Jesus is Lord, and it's clear from verse 3 that the only way an individual person can declare that Jesus is Lord is by the Spirit. Look at verse 3 again. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. And that verse is important in understanding the rest of this text that talks about the spiritual gifts in a couple of ways. So first, before narrowing the discussion to talk about the spiritual gift, Paul references one of the broad works of the Spirit. And we just looked at some of the broad works of the Spirit in the first session. Here in verse 3, he's referencing the regenerating work of the Spirit. Jesus talked about that in John chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. You know those verses. That which is born of flesh is flesh, right? But that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. He's talking about the regenerating work of the Spirit. And we have to be reminded of who we were. We were once dead in our sins. And then the Spirit acts upon us. And He brings our dead souls to life. He convicts us of sin and shows us of our need for a Savior. That is the greatest miracle you and I will ever know. That of conversion, the regenerating work of the Spirit. So before he talks about the, narrows the discussion about the spiritual gifts, he's reminding us There's a number of broad works of the Spirit in your life, and one of those is your regeneration. It's why you're sitting here tonight as a Christian. Second, here's a second reason this verse is important. We know from verse 3 that our conversion, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, reminding us that we have a daily need to be filled with the Spirit, which is why I reference this in the question, or in the answer to the question in Ephesians 5.18, why he writes in present tense language, be filled with the Spirit. See, so he's reminding them Christians are spiritual people who are indwelt with the Spirit of God and have a daily need to be filled with the Spirit of God so we can experience the presence and power of the Spirit in our lives. So let me ask you, are you here this weekend because you want more of that? Do you want more of the Spirit's presence and the Spirit's power in your lives? I believe that's why part of the reason that you are here. And one of the ways that we experience the Spirit's power and presence in our lives is we use our spiritual gifts that He has given us. Which is why Paul begins this section in Corinthians, by saying, now concerning spiritual gifts. And this is relevant for you as a church, or the churches that you come from, because in this church, and in our family of churches, we don't believe the gifts have ceased. We are not cessationists, if you know that term. 
But we believe the gifts are for today. We are continuationists, meaning that we believe the gifts are to continue to be used until Christ returns. So what Paul's about to say about the gifts is very relevant to you as a member of this church and maybe the church that you are a part of. Um, It's important. So what I want to do is quickly look at four characteristics of the gifts that we see here in Scripture. Here's the first one. Gifts are given and empowered by God. You see that in verses 4 through 6 and then in verse 11. Look at verses 4 through 6 again. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. And then verse 11, after he names a number of the gifts, all these, all these gifts, are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions, who gives to each one individually as he wills. Now what's striking in those verses, verses 4 through 6 in particular, is that every member of the Trinity is mentioned. Did you see that? The Holy Spirit in verse 4. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God in verse 5. God the Father in verse 6. And did you know, before each member of the Trinity is mentioned, he uses this word in the ESV, varieties. Varieties of gifts, varieties of service, varieties of activities. So Paul is saying that God has given His church a variety, a diversity of gifts, and that diversity has its root in the Trinity itself. Each member of the Trinity, as we saw in the first session, is fully God, and yet each member of the Trinity has a different function or role or service. There's a variety of of service that you see in the Trinity. And according to verse 11, God has given each of you gifts, and He empowers that those diverse gifts, to serve others in a way that reflects the diversity and unity in the Trinitarian Godhead itself. That's a massive theological truth, right? Get your head around that. When you come here and you serve on a Sunday or you administrate this meeting and you're all doing that together, you as a church are reflecting the diversity and unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Wow! Wow! That is quite a theological truth. And when you do that in love and in unity, you reflect the unity of the Trinity. See, according to verse 11, God has given each of you gifts. And when you use them in the way that God intends, you bring God much glory. Because they're reflecting something about His Trinitarian nature. See, it's important that you don't miss the theological construct of verses 4 through 6 and looking at the gifts so that, here's one practical application, so that the gifts don't become about us. Because the gifts aren't given for us. They're given to us to serve others and, as we can see from these verses, to give God glory, the ultimate purpose, to reflect something of the Trinitarian Godhead. So maybe you come from a church that didn't believe in the gifts. I came from that. I understand. Or you've come from a church where they misuse the gifts. And what you've seen, and the reason maybe you come here, maybe a little skeptical, is that you've seen the gifts used wrongly. Meaning a part of the way they're used wrongly is that they focus on people. And that's not the intention. We can see from Scripture, that's not the intention of the gifts. They're not to focus on you. They are given to serve others and to bring all the attention and all the glory to God. So that is an error that this church and our family of churches, that's a mistake, that's an error that we are seeking to avoid. Because we believe that God has given this church a variety of gifts and they're to be used in a way that ultimately strengthen this church and most importantly, give God glory. Now, it also seems intentional there in verses 4 through 6, in these 11 verses, that twice it's mentioned that God empowers the gifts. He he does it twice. He doesn't just say it once. Verse 6 and verse 11. He's saying to use our spiritual gifts 
in a way that serves others, and in a way that brings glory to God, we need power. And we need God's power. So what are these spiritual gifts? How, how would you give a broad definition of the spiritual gifts? I like this one from Boyd Hunt. He says this, spiritual gifts are God empowering his people through the Holy Spirit for kingdom life and service, enabling them in attitude and action to live and minister in a manner which glorifies Christ. So some gifts look more like natural abilities. You'll see later in this chapter, if you read the whole chapter, uh, the gifts of helping, verse 28, the, the gift of administration is also in that verse. They look more like natural gifts. Other gifts look more supernatural, like healing and prophecy that are mentioned there in verse 10 that we read. So gifts, in, as they are used in the New Testament, they, they describe this broad and diverse group of abilities and talents and gifts that God gives to each of us to minister to others in a way that glorifies Jesus Christ. Spiritual gifts are given and empowered by God so that each of you, each of us, can participate in kingdom life, in ministry, and in gospel mission. So that's, that's a, sort of a broad definition of the gifts. All right, second characteristic, number two. Gifts are a manifestation of God's presence. Look at verse 7. To each is given the manifestation, manifestation of what? Of the Spirit for the common good. So one of the ways that God manifests His presence among us, He does it in a number of ways. He does that through His Word, for example. But one of the ways that He manifests His presence among us in a way that we actually experience His presence, is when we use our gifts in the power that God gives us. I think Max Turner says it well in his book, uh, The Holy Spirit and the Spiritual Gifts. He said, the thread running through the whole discussion in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 through 10, is that the phenomena Paul lists are regarded as events in which the Spirit is made manifest. That is, the Spirit's activity coming to relatively clear even dramatic expression. They are workings of God in which the presence and activity of divine power is judged to be a matter of immediate perception. I like guess it's true. And what that means is God loves to fill ordinary people like you and me with His Spirit and give us power to use the gifts He's given us to minister and serve others in a way that we know He's with us that He is among us. So if you desire, if you came this weekend because you desire more of God's presence, one of the ways that you can pursue that presence is to use your gifts in the power the Spirit provides. If you do that, you will experience God. We experience more of God's presence by using our spiritual gifts. Let me just give you an illustration. This happened at our church, um, I was trying to remember, sometime in the last couple of years. It's, it's fairly recent. Um, one of the ways we practice the gift of healing at Covenant Fellowship, and this is just a practice, churches don't have to do this, it's just a practice, keep that in mind. Um, but one of the ways that we do, that, do it is uh, every fourth Sunday, after we close the service, I mean, we give a benediction, we tell folks that we, if they like to pray for healing, they to come forward. So the service is ended, people leave, um, and some people come forward, and we pray for them. And we've seen um, miraculous healings in our church as a result of pe just ordinary Christians praying for ordinary Christians who have the gift of healing. And this was a particular Sunday um, where we had a prayer team that was praying before the service, and um, they just had this impression, I would say it's a prophetic impression, we'll talk about that tomorrow, that there were people there that morning that had abdominal problems, diverticul diverticulitis in particular, and that God wanted to potentially heal them. And so uh, the pastor that closed the meeting, I forget who closed the meeting that Sunday, I kind of think it was Andy Farmer, um, as, as we finish up the meeting, we're going to, if you like prayer for healing, come forward. Some of our prayer team just had this 
thought from God, this impression from God that there may be some here who have uh, just severe abdominal issues, may potentially diverticulitis in particular. And if that's you, you know, it could be, those are some of the people we want to come forward. So uh, I'm over there. I'm praying for people. And there's this woman I'd never met before. And she introduced herself. She goes, I'm not a member of this church. And I'm a cessationist. I don't believe that gifts are for today. But I came with my friend, Janny Bard, Dave and Janny Bard. You guys know who that is. And I'm sure that she's looking from her seat in shock that I'm up here asking for prayer. <laughs> and I said, well, why are you up here? And she said, well, I came, and when I heard there was prayer for healing, I thought, I'm not going up. But when they said diverticulitis and severe abdominal issues, I had to come. Because I've had severe diverticulitis for years. And the doctors aren't able to cure it. And I'm coming and asking that you would pray for me. A cessationist gets out of her seat and comes forward and I pray for her. Now, I don't know whether she was healed or not. So that's not a part of the story. I pray she was. I don't know because I've not seen her since. I probably should ask Janie now that I think about it. Um, but the, the, the point is this. There was an undeniable manifestation of God's presence for this woman. Right? She couldn't deny that that impression applied to her. And she, even though she doesn't believe the gifts are today, came forward because she was desperate for healing. See, God manifests his presence among us when we use our gifts. Amazing, isn't it? It's amazing that the God of the universe, running right the whole universe, does that for that woman on that Sunday, maybe the only Sunday she's been in our church for a long time. That's amazing love. My goodness. That brings God glory. Amen? Yes. Amen. Third characteristic. Gifts are for the common good. You saw that in verse 7, right? They're a manifestation. They're given to each one. A manifestation of the Spirit. For what purpose? For the common good. They are given to strengthen the life of the church and to serve the church. So all the gifts that are listed here in 1 Corinthians 12, but also in Romans 12 and in 1 Peter 4 and in Ephesians 4, all of those gifts that are listed are for the common good. And again, it reminds us that gifts are not given for us. They're not given to draw attention to us. Gifts are given to serve others. They're very much other-centered, other-oriented, and god glorifying. Max Turner says this in the same book I referenced earlier, the gift of spirit to believers affords the whole experiential dimension of the Christian life, which is essentially charismatic in nature. These charismata, that, that charismata means gifts, these gifts operate at individual and corporate levels, enabling a life-giving, joyful understanding of an ability to apply the gospel impelling and enabling different services to others in the church, and driving and empowering the mission to proclaim the good news. So for this church, for your church, to serve others the way you're supposed to, the gifts must be operative. And for this church to be involved in mission of proclaiming the good news, it powerfully must use the gifts, because that strengthens the mission of the gospel, which leads to my fourth characteristic. Gifts must stay connected to the gospel. I'm going to say this on purpose like three different, in three different teachings this week, this weekend. And I'm doing it on purpose. I'm doing it intentional. I'm like, should I repeat that? I felt like the God said, yeah, repeat that. Here's why. One of the errors that can be made in the charismatic world or the, the Pentecostal world is they put an overemphasis on the gifts, and in doing so, I believe unintentionally, they functionally separate the gifts from the gospel. Because there's too much focus on the gifts. There's, a, there's, there's too much of a proportion of a gift focus in alongside of the gospel. And that's important. I, I love what, the way Graham Cole says it, and he references J.C. Ryle, who says it really well. J.C. Ryle suggested that the gospel may be spoiled in a number of ways. 
We can spoil the gospel by substituting for Christ's saving work on the cross. For example, our good deeds, as Pelagius did. We can spoil cross work by adding to it, for example, faith plus circumcision as, the Galatians, as in the Galatians era. We can also spoil the gospel by disproportion when secondary biblical accents become primary. For example, clerical clothing, to which Derek says, Amen. <laughs> we can spoil the gospel when the New Testament sense of proportion is lost and pneumatology becomes, becomes our primary emphasis rather than Christology. The idea that in some charismatic circles, for example, that the major compass point for moving ahead in active ministry is not the cross, but charisma, charismata, is extremely troubling. I agree with him. That is extremely troubling. So we must not put a disproportionate emphasis on the gifts. They must stay connected to the gospel. Just the way that this letter is structured tells you that. Okay, Paul begins this letter very early. We looked at it last session. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. And he said to the Corinthians, what? I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now he goes on and he addresses a number of issues. He's addressing divisions in the church, lawsuits among believers, uh, uh, sexual immorality, uh, food, uh, idols, worship and food sacrifice to idols. He's addressing the spiritual gifts. In all of those issues, what is the one thing that he knows? It is Christ and Him crucified. So as he addresses every one of those topics as he moves through this letter, the gospel threads all the way through, right? And then he gets to 1 Corinthians 15. He said, this is, I, I delivered to you that which is of first importance. Well, what's of first importance? Does he say it's the gifts? No. What does he say in verse 3 there in chapter 15? That Christ died for our sins. That he was buried. And that he rose again and it goes on and on. So he, he begins with the gospel. The gospel threads through the letter. He ends the letter saying, this is of most importance. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So just the way the letter is structured tells you that the gifts must stay connected to the gospel. Because as we use the gifts and we receive the benefit from the gifts, they are given to strengthen the ongoing work of the gospel in our lives. So for the believer, we'll talk about this tomorrow when we talk about prophecy. For the believer, the edification, the encouragement one can receive from a prophetic word is, in to, is intended to provide just encouragement for them to continue to follow Christ and to continue the work of the gospel in their lives. And at times, prophecy will be used to awaken unbelievers' need for the gospel. We'll look at that tomorrow on 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 through 25. You know those verses? Unbelievers there, and a prophetic word is given, and the secrets of their heart are revealed, right? You're familiar with that? Why? Because Christ is drawing them and attempting to save them. So those are the four characteristics I wanted to go through. And let me close with an illustration of what I just taught there about how the gifts are used to continue the work of the gospel in our lives. Um, on some Sundays, not every, well, every Sunday, we as pastors at Covenant Fellowship, we gather and we pray before the service. It's not a long time. It's I don't know, typically 15, 20 minutes, we're going through the service and then we pray. And there are times when some of the pastors come with sort of a, just a thought or impression that we're, to, that we're to pray for a specific group of people. And that particular morning, I think it was Jim Donahue came, I think Jim was here sometime in the last few years, right? Yeah, two years ago. And he said, I just, I just come this morning thinking we're supposed to pray for people this morning who arrive here feeling like a failure in one specific area or just in general. So, that, so we're, we're singing through some songs, and we took a pause in one of the songs, and he's, he gets up on stage and he identifies that group. And we, did, we prayed for them. But what, what we didn't know is that one of the 
folks on our prophecy team, Ramona Doyle, that morning was praying and felt like the Lord gave her a word related to people who felt failure. And um, this, is what she, this is what she said. Um, I shared a word for that group that the Lord had put on my heart during early morning prayer earlier. I had a picture of someone trying to ride a unicycle. Now stop right there. I don't think I would have the faith to walk up to our mic and tell one of our pastors, I have a picture of someone trying to ride a unicycle. Sounds crazy, right? If I was at the mic that morning, I don't know that I would let her give this word. I, I just, it reveals my, my lack of faith and Ramona's faith. My goodness. I, I had a picture of someone trying to ride a unicycle, but it was hard and challenging, so much so that no matter how hard they tried, they could only make it go backwards. And she just thought it was a, she believed it was a, a, a picture about them experiencing condemnation and failure. That their life was just going backwards. My word was about condemnation out of the first few verses of Romans 8. You know verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Specifically reminding folks that the Lord himself had fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law, and they stand not under wrath, but under grace. And calling folks to not let their eyes be cast down in condemnation, but to lift their eyes to God of hope, who by his word of truth at work in them, and by the power of his spirit, would complete his good purposes in their lives. That was the word, prophetic word that she delivered. And we went on with our meeting and uh, it was wonderful to pray for those folks. Well, that afternoon, Ramona got a call from a single lady in our church who is actually dating a guy who rides a unicycle. Can't make that up, can you? He, he rides a unicycle. And just the day before that service, that Saturday, they were talking together, this, this woman and her boyfriend who rides a unicycle, and she was talking about her past failures and her fears for the future. She was feeling like a failure and wondering about how that would affect their relationship, if their relationship moved forward, and said, I found that word very specific. Not because her boyfriend rides a unicycle, but the theme of the word, most importantly. Because she was experiencing that kind of failure and condemnation. Uh, she found that word very specifically encouraging and it ministered to her in the midst of her situation. Now, this woman is a Christian. That word edified her. It encouraged her to continue to follow Christ. It is an, it's an example of how the gifts can be used in a way that strengthens the work of the gospel in our lives. And there was a specificity to that word. That, that word may have been for that lady only. And yet this is the other amazing thing. The God of the universe on that Sunday knew how this lady was coming to our church and gave Ramona a word that I wouldn't have come up with, I must admit, to speak to her specifically. That is, a, that is a good God who personally loves his people. That's amazing. And we get to enjoy all that because of what Christ has done for us in the gospel. Keep the gifts connected to the gospel. The gifts are given and empowered by God to serve others, to edify the church, to encourage the work of the gospel in our lives, and when they're used biblically, we'll talk about that tomorrow, and in humility, they give God, the giver of the gifts, much glory. Amen. All right.